Good afternoon. It seems a little funny to be up at the front when all of you are at the back. Um, I'm Gail Etchmeyer. I'm the Dean of University Libraries, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2020 Critical Thinking Symposium. This symposium is a collaborative project between the Provost's Office, the University Libraries, the Union University Communications, and many campus partners. I would like to especially thank the members of the steering committee who planned this conference, Lindsay Wharton and Pri Gorecki, who co-chaired this, Beth Boatwright, Lynn Hogan, Robin Brock, and Mike Meth. So thank you. I'd also like to thank Paul Marty from the College of Communication and Information for coordinating the talk later um, in the program by Dr. Young Moo Kim. This year, the theme of this symposium is digital citizenship in society. In thinking about what it means to be a good citizen, I think we all think about our roles, our obligations in society to become educated, to be informed, to reflect on issues, to participate, and to really take accountability for how we participate. And in the digital context, I think it's very interesting to think about how this translates, especially with the anonymity that so many of us have in an online environment. This symposium is an opportunity for the campus community to engage in a discussion about what it really means to be a good digital citizen, about the ethics and good citizenship. I think it's interesting that we have terms like netiquette, in addition to engagement and advocacy about technology. And I'm really looking forward to hearing some of those discussions and to participating in them. Over these next days, we'll hear events about what is being done in research and teaching. I want to especially point out the keynote where David Ryan Polger will discuss big tech, public policy, and how we can all be involved in ensuring a bright future for technology in America. I also want to point out this program that tells you about some of these key events. And I want to give credit to our marketing and communications team for doing what I think is a stellar job in creating this. So I know you're all anxious to start the program. And it is now my pleasure to introduce Beth Boatwright, who is the Director of Service Strategies for FSU Libraries, and who will in introduce our first faculty panel. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you all are here. Um, those of you that are looking outside the door, feel free to come on in. Um, and hi, especially to those of you who are joining us live streaming to Panama City and um, all of our other campus partners who are visiting us online today. I'm extremely pleased to introduce um, our faculty speakers today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce both of them now, um, then they'll speak, and then if you can save your questions, but write your questions down. Save your questions, and we'll do questions at the end. Um, our first speaker this morning, is, or this afternoon, is Dr. Dina Rollinger. She is professional, Professor of Sociology and Associate Dean for Faculty Development and Community Engagement, which I want to learn more about that. We'll have to talk more later. Um, I'm excited to hear her presentation about how individuals and groups use digital media to affect public debate. We'll also um, welcome Renee Julian, Director of STEM Libraries, and he'll tell you a little bit more about that when he speaks. So Dr. Dina Rollinger, everybody, thank you. All right, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited. This is my first live stream, so hi. <laughs> So again, I'm Dr. Dina Rollinger, and I'm a sociologist. So I will be telling you a little bit about what sociology is, how I understand digital citizenship, talk quickly about two lessons I've learned through my research, and then end with some conversation about how you might be a better digital citizen. So sociology, what is it? It's huge. I mean, sociologists study society, social relationships, social interactions, and culture. So that's a giant discipline. In my department alone, I have colleagues that study where people are going to move as the sea level rises from the coast 
to microloans in India and whether or not this improves the economic situations of women. So it's, this, it's a giant area where people use all kinds of methods. So if you're interested in sociology, come and see me. I'm happy to tell you more about it. But what I study is I'm really interested in how individuals and groups use media to get what they want. And I am really interested in groups that are on opposite sides of an issue. So how do groups that don't agree on much, how might they work sometimes with each other and against each other to forward their goals? I look at old media, old media, you know, broadcast, television, and newspapers, and new media, so social media, emails, websites, all of those sorts of things. And I use a variety of techniques. So what I'll talk about is some controversial issues. I won't be talking about abortion, but I study abortion. I study death with dignity. I study gun rights. These are all topics that come up in the course of my research. If you want to learn more, you can see my web address. Um, so when I think about digital citizenship, I'm specifically interested in how these people and groups that typically don't have a lot of power, what are they doing with digital media to get what they want and influence these public debates and these decision makers. So the two lessons that I'll talk about today are first, there's lots of ways that you can get politically involved in the digital age, which we probably all say, yeah. But what you might not know is a lot of them actually do matter. So that's good news. The less good news is there's good and bad actors on social media and Unfortunately, in some cases, they both can affect public debate. So lesson number one, getting involved in the digital age. So how I really got passionate about you know, sort of this digital technology is with, the, with this romantic idea that participation is for the young. And that's true, like you think of all these pictures and you're like, yeah, it's, you know, it's high school and college kids, they're the ones that are out there in the streets and really doing this work that matters. And it's because they have the time and the energy and, and you know, sometimes resources to do it. And then you graduate, get a job, have a family, and it's all over. And that's a pretty romantic notion, right? There's always been some segment of the population that's been really engaged in a much larger segment of the population that hasn't been engaged much at all. And this hasn't really changed in the digital age, except for there certainly new technology have allowed us like me as a, as a professor and associate dean with two kids and a partner and who spends most of her day wondering how she's getting from one place to the next, do things occasionally that make me feel good about my participation. So what, we, what people used to call those folks that went online and liked things and shared things, they called them slacktivists. They weren't activists, they were slacktivists because they would like something and share something and they, thought, they felt really good about themselves and thought they had done something meaningful, but that wasn't really true. Well, there's more than, happening. There's more than just slacktivism happening in the digital age. So one of the projects that took place over several years that involved several graduate students of mine is I looked at two different, very different kinds of groups. The more progressive moveon.org and the more conservative Tea Party. And what I was really interested in is how did technology get people engaged? Like, did they stay engaged over time? And how, to what extent did technology even matter? Would they have gotten engaged anyway in one of these groups if they hadn't found out about it, about it online? And um, these, what I was really fascinated about these two particular groups is first they wanted the same thing, which always still kind of blows my mind. Like both of these groups started because they were tired of inside the Beltway politics. Like, like they're like, hey, there's all these Washington elites. It's baloney. They're making all the decisions that kind of like trickles out to the rest of the country. And politicians and these parties need to listen to average citizens much more. And our goal is to make them more accountable to us, the voters. So they share that, but they're structured really differently. So if you know Move On, it's kind of this hierarchically structured organization. And that just means there's some people that get paid on the top and they make a lot of the decisions. They decide, here's our agenda, and here's how a campaign can be run. And then they disseminate that information to everybody else, and you can kind of opt in or opt out. That was not true of 
the more conservative Tea Party, and that was horizontally structured. And that just means that there wasn't this kind of real clear leadership structure. It was much more grassroots oriented. And so there was all these different voices and sometimes different groups mobilizing around similar issues to try to get things done. So what this means is, in some ways, they had some similar opportunities to participate, which you can see. But there were some really different ways uh, opportunities to participate. So it's like with Move On, you could sign petitions, you can donate money to their campaigns, you can vote on their agenda. They would give you opportunities to go and participate in a vigil or a protest, or they'd teach you how to canvas, or they'd tell you where there was a meeting you could go. And then they would even give you some opportunities to learn some leadership skills, which, I mean, people love. Like, Middle-aged people love it because they're like, I've never been a leader in my life or I've never held a meeting. And they would literally kind of send them a care package of this is how you do it. And so people had an opportunity to pick up a new skill that they never would have had time for otherwise. Now, the Tea Party movement didn't do that. It still, but it still offered a lot of opportunities to discuss political issues, like what was important in local campaigns and state campaigns, who did they care about, like what were the most pressing issues. They participated in rallies. You could attend different kinds of group meetings, anything from like a book group to a more explicitly political organization. And you could participate in the overall direction of the movement and what was really critically different is you could build community the problem when you have a hierarchical group where everything kind of trickles down is those networks disappear as soon as an event ends what happened with the tea party movement particularly in the state of florida is they were all connected online and so they built these lasting communities that ended up being very consequential so both of these groups were consequential, honestly. And the consequence was similar, even though how they achieved it was, was quite different. So move on, help make the Democratic Party more liberal. They've been doing that. This is, you know, we act like Bernie Sanders is like the last, you know, five, six years. No, I mean, groups like Move On have been working for more than 20 years to try to get the Democratic Party to be more responsive. For 20 years, they've been trying to get more progressive people in that Democratic Party leadership and have done so successfully and also focused on more state level elections, right? So they've helped move the Democratic Party to the left. The Tea Party has helped move the Republican Party to the right. And it was so interesting to kind of watch it unfold because we're you know, going to their meetings and we're going to the rallies and we're doing interviews at different points of time. And in 2012, like when we were doing some, some of our interviews, you know, Tea Party members were saying, yeah, we're not excited about Mitt Romney, but we don't care about Mitt Romney. We care about the candidate of the future. We care about the candidate, this might sound familiar, who's going to shake up the political system and change how we think about politics and how politics are done. So, you know, that's why the picture of the Trump train, right? Some of these communities mattered in terms of helping shape the party where it's at now. So lesson number two, individuals matter. So one of the other topics I'm super interested in, I guess because I live in Florida or, and it's an important social issue that we're grappling with right now is sort of the debate over gun rights. And so um, I worked with some undergraduate students and a graduate student, and we looked at two school shootings. The second one actually isn't a school shooting, which I'll tell you in a, in a minute. And the one was here at Florida State, and the other at Ohio State University. And I was interested in who is shaping discourse right after these events. So we scraped data from Twitter for the seven days after each of these incidents. And we really looked at like, who matters here. So we had like more than 10,000 tweets, and we had newspaper stories, and we looked at institutions. We were trying to figure out like, who matters during these moments. And that's really critical in terms of thinking about digital citizenship in our democracy, because these, you know, this is part of our policy debate. right? This is part of our political process. So the first incident was here at Florida State in 2014. Um, Myron May, who was a former FSU graduate, entered the library shortly after midnight with a gun. Um, he, the uh, incident, he actually came in, if you're not familiar with it, there was a turnstile. He didn't know what to do. He turned around, went outside. He got off a few shots. The incident was done in less than two minutes. Um, and it turns out 
he was mentally ill. I mean, he thought his, the government, he literally thought the government was controlling his actions. So the second incident, strangely enough, took almost place almost two years later in 2016. And this was um, Abdul Artan, who was a current OSU student. And he waited in his car before 10 a.m with a knife as classes were changing. He drove into a crowd, jumped out of the, his vehicle with a machete and started attacking students. It was on Twitter, people started saying OSU, ha OSU shooting as a hashtag and it stuck. There was actually only 37 tweets that used the an OSU stabbing hashtag for reasons I'm not quite sure, but the incident, uh, as well only lasted two minutes. It's really not clear why he did it um, to this day. It was framed as a potential act of terrorism because he was a refugee and, and an immigrant, but there was no evidence found that that was actually the case. So what we found are good actors and bad actors in these cases matter. And what I mean is good actors can shape the debate in positive ways. And the good actor was in the FSU case. So what you'll see here are these accounts, these are the accounts with the most tweets and retweets that week after the FSU incident. And what you'll notice is you have local, see, local journalists, and number three, journalists, and number five, local journalists, number six, national outlet. So you have people that are getting out good information. And that was so critical because the first half hour after the shooting, there were the conspiracy theorists online. There were people, trolls, just circulating incorrect information, particularly a couple of students that were affected. So the other instance was the bad actors in the Ohio State University case. And what you'll see is a very different list when you look at the accounts with the most tweets and retweets. Troll, 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 individual, troll, activist, troll. That's a lot of trolls. And what trolls are, we define them as people that were intentionally circulating bad information. So in this case, the, there were four trolls that were really focus on circulating circulating the Sam Hyde is the shooter meme. So the Sam Hyde is the shooter meme emerged in 2014 May after the UC Santa Barbara shooting. And this guy there, Sam Hyde, he calls himself a comedian and he thought it was really amusing way to get himself some attention by saying he was the shooter. And now it frequently happens anytime there's a school shooting, you will have the Sam Hyde is the shooter meme. It really took hold after the Ohio State shooting. So a couple of the trolls were simply like, we're students at OSU, Sam Hyde is the shooter, he just shot my brother kind of thing. But the ones that really had the effect that made the subsequent conversation over the course of the week much more negative were focused on politics, which I should have had my, let me see if I can read it off of this. So they would do the left versus right kind of tweets. So one said, um, tweeted, OSU shooting, hearing rumors that neo-Nazi leader Sam Hyde is behind this atrocity. Please stay safe. And a different account blamed the Antifa and tweeted, OSU shooter identified as Hillary supporter and Antifa activist Samuel Heidenstein. So really what the trolls were doing is tried to play on political divisions to make, to really shut down conversation, right? So it did end up being a lot of disinformation and a lot of um, mudslinging in the week after online. So, that's a little bit about the two lessons. Um, what I'm doing now is I'm continuing working on gun control. I'm really interested in discourse around the Florida gun control that we had in the wake of Parkland. I've been working with uh, some graduate students and uh, some, another faculty from a different institution to look at tweets. We had 8.5 million tweets, so we had to narrow it down to a two-week wi window so that we had far fewer tweets. Uh, we still have over 13,000. We've interviewed, we've uh, coded almost 6,000 tweets. Just looking at gun rights supporters, like what do they say publicly on Twitter 
And then we were also looking at 5,000 emails that were sent to Rick Scott in the same two week period to see what is the kind of private claims they use. So anyone can kind of scream into the Twitterverse, but when you're trying to convince somebody to do something, or in this case, to not do something, right, not sign um, gun legislation, what are the kinds of arguments that you make? And the second project I'm working on that's related to digital citizenship looks at deliberative cultures on the left and right. And so I'm looking at some of those really popular outlets like Breitbart and Huffington Post and lo looking at how are people having conversations relative to you know, the, news, the news stories of the day. So the assumption is partisan outlets are evil. They're making everything worse. They're creating polar, they're making polarization worse. And I'm not sure that's true because historically there's been a lot of good functions partisan outlets have played in our society. Like sometimes you do need to talk with like-minded people about your ideas and test them, right? And theoretically, if you if a group can get to a place where they feel like they have a good policy, it would filter its way into the mainstream and become part of the debate. So I'm certainly not saying that you know, there's all you know bunnies and rainbows happening on the left and right, but I'm certain what I am testing is whether or not we're missing something by assuming that they do little more than feed political polarization in the US. So what are a couple of things that you can do now to work on your digital citizenship? Well, first you can know and question your media sources. I mean, we, we know that in some ways, but what we don't think about are the hard questions. Like, why are they doing this story now? What sources are left out? Are there perspectives that should be there that aren't? Um, you can also know your opponent's point of view. And I don't mean know what the, your favorite news source says your opponent's point of view is. Actually go and do some work. And it's not that hard. There's a couple of sites, one called Accuracy in Media, which, con which is conservative, and Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, which is more liberal, uh, that have been around for decades. And they, they do some critical analysis of news and they insert their respective positions into it. So you can, it's a really easy way to find out what your, oppo your political opponent thinks. And then last, you can engage locally with an, an open mind. And I've been doing a few talks lately and people always run up after and it's like, okay, well, what do we do to make things better? It's like, well, have conversations with people you don't know. I mean, FSU is great for that, the longest table, right? Power, we've, there, we have some excellent programs, but if you wanna go beyond that, we have in Tallahassee, the Village Square, which does a great job of providing, you know, these con talking about controversial topics across political divides. And then if you wanna start a group, um, groups like the National Institute for Civil Discourse, which I, I should tell you, I am a, a member of their research network. They have guides on what you can do, how you can start these kinds of conversation so that we can move things forward more productively. Because at the end of the day, this works because we let it work, right? Politicians and media respond to us. They're only gonna respond to us if we make them respond differently. So, but thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rollinger. Um, next up, we have uh, Renee Julian, uh, Director of STEM Libraries. But for everybody watching, both in the room and online, I want to remind you that we have a hashtag. If you if you tweet at uh, hashtag FSU Critical Thinking 2020, uh, you can put your questions there, and that way we can have um, FAQ at the end from everybody, not just people in the room. Renee Julian. Hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Renee Julian, and I'm the director of STEM Libraries. Um, I'm going to be discussing a, a new topic, at least for me, and it's um, sort of looking at the idea of open science as um, looking at open science through the lens of digital citizenship. So I sort of prepared talking points. So I'm going to read from them a lot just to keep myself on point for accuracy's sake. Um, so uh, like I said earlier, I'm the director of STEM Libraries. Um, what that actually means is that I lead a team of faculty and staff 
that provide support and collaborate with our STEM scholars across the research, teaching, and learning life cycles. Um, a lot of this work ensures that our faculty and staff have access to the materials they need, journal articles, books like that to do their research. Um, but we also do a lot of other lesser known things such as consultations on how you should manage your research data, um, finding and evaluating data repositories, and in general, just sort of helping our scholars tear down barriers to scientific information through education, training, and advocacy. Um, today, I'm going to do that part. I'm going to advocate. So I'm going to advocate for the destruction of, sci of barriers to research and scholarship that impede our ability to solve problems and enhance scientific discovery. So I'm going to jump around between the concepts like open data, open access, and try to tie in how championing, champion, championing those things advances um, or it makes us all better digital citizens. Um, that's it. So um, I provided a definition for open science. There's a lot of different ones. Um, this one describes it as a movement to make scientific research and its dissemination accessible to all levels of an inquiring society. That includes professional and amateur. Um, but I want you to kind of um, notice the second part, which focuses on um, collaborative networks that actually disseminate open science. So um, these, collaboration, these collaborative networks are um, the most important part of making science open. And um, what I'm going to talk about uh, mostly today, because it ties into digital citizenship, these networks are people, but they're also the systems that these people use. So social media is one of those. Uh, science Twitter is a thing. Um, but also um, other digital tools, like data repositories and preprint servers that help disseminate knowledge at a more rapid rate. So one of the things that, um, that impedes the progress of open science is the current academic publishing model. Um, as you can see, much of the research that's conducted um, in science is actually at public institutions like this one. Um, and our scholars publish their findings in journals, and they typically forfeit their ownership of um, these journal articles for the sake of advancing human knowledge. And so once the article is submitted, it's reviewed by other researchers in a process that we call peer review. Um, and then that work is also typically done without compensation. And then what happens is those results are published, and they're typically moved behind a paywall where institutions are forced to pay once again for the access of the scientific research that's produced at their institution. So that's the current model. Um, there are things that we can do to push back. Um, at, for example, um, open access. Um, Let's see. That's right. So making things open access is making things free online, um, high quality peer reviewed research results um, publicly available. This can be done one or two ways. You can publish your results in an open access journal, or you can put things in other places like preprint servers or an institutional repository. Um, there's a few things that you can do there that we can do specifically to push back. So, for example, at FSU in 2016, an open access resolution was unanimously passed through our faculty senate, um, and it modeled open access policies at other institutions. So, it grants faculty um, permission to make versions of their scholarly journal articles available in digital, which is FSU's research repository. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and while the institutional repository can hold a lot of different types of scholarships, such as data sets, this policy is focused specifically on journal articles. So what else can we do to make things open besides make the journal articles openly available? Well, I'm going to sort of um, present three ideas for making things and scientific uh, research more openly available. The first is to utilize preprint services and servers to disseminate ideas and preliminary research results. The other is to make data openly available whenever possible. And the last is publishing in open access journals or utilizing institutional repositories when appropriate. So I'm going to use the next couple of minutes to kind of jump into like what those things are. Preprints are a version of um, a scientific manuscript that's typically posted prior to peer review. There are many incentives for scholars to use um, preprints. Um, sometimes it's to get preliminary feedback to help them advance their own research, but other times it's simply staking a claim to an area of research. So since peer review and academic publishing processes can take um, a really long time, preprints allow scientists and scholars to put that information on the internet with citable identifiers that sort of verify where they are in the research process. But as you can see, there's a lot of other great benefits to using it, such as community engagement and getting um, ideas on your research prior to publication so that you can use that information to make revisions as you get an article ready. 
Um, but there are also other ways um, you can uh, utilize them. For example, some authors opt to put their book chapters um, um, on preprint servers. And so I'm actually um, going to do that at some point because I uh, published a book chapter with a few other folks here in the libraries. And um, I'm going to go out on a limb and assume not a lot of people are going to buy that book. And so what we're going to do is when the embargo period passes, we're going to put that chapter in a place called LIS Archive, which is an information science preprint server. And the idea is that, you know, through the power of social media, we can push out that research and hopefully people can read our ideas and give us feedback. So that's just another way to kind of use um, preprints. The next thing is to make data open. This is my favorite. I used to be a data librarian. Um, so in addition to putting scholarship and preprint servers um, and taking your work out from behind a paywall, you can actually publish your research data um, as a piece of scholarship itself. Um, data are inputs to research and subsequent scholarship, and one of our associate deans describes data as the bits and bytes that make scholarship happen, which I actually like that definition a lot. Um, so many researchers, particularly in the health sciences, they work with human subject data, um, and it makes data sharing in many cases practically impossible, but most of us don't. And most of us, when we do work with human subjects data, are actually doing it in the form of surveys, and we can scrub that data and anonymize it or anonymize the results by aggregating that data before publication. So there are a lot of things that we can do as scholars to um, make our data more openly available, like putting it in a repository. Um, but also notice that making data open is more than just making it publicly available. So putting it on the internet behind a paywall isn't enough. It also involves um, copyright and what others can do with your data. So you have to permit others to, it has to involve universal participation to where others can use and reuse that data in a way that makes sense to them. And so data repositories are how most people make data open. That's kind of the easiest way. Um, data sharing is most effective when it's put in a repository. And so a repository is a place to um, store data and make it available to others to use or analyze in the future. Um, this data can be made publicly available or it can have mediated access where you deposit your data in a repository and others will see the metadata and information behind it and they can actually make a request to access that data set. For pe people who are working with human subjects, a lot of times that's the only way to make data more open. But repositories can help with that function as well. Um, there's subject-based repositories for all kinds of disciplines. The two I included are ICPSR, which is the, I shouldn't even try this, the inner consortial something for political and social research. Um, and, the, and that is focused on behavioral and um, social science research data. If you are a um, social science student and you're working on methods and you want to find data sets to practice new methods, ICPSR is a great place. Um, and the other one I listed is Triad, which is more of a um, life sciences and biology um, they, uh, repository. But there's all kinds of tools you can use. So I in included a thing called Re3Data, which is actually a registry of data repositories. So if you, don't, if you have a data set that you think could be of use to the scientific community, you don't know where to put it, Re3Data can help. The libraries can also help because we have data librarians that are employed to help you with just those types of things. So what I'm going to do now is I've sort of painted a little picture of open data and um, how we can be good digital citizens by sort of making our science and our data open when possible. So I'm going to sort of use a current example to highlight how open data can help us solve problems. Um, the coronavirus, um, I was doing some research last week and I identified uh, three different sort of articles or initiatives that um, that where open data is helping um, contain the spread of the virus. So one is um, understanding the virus by utilizing genomic data that's already available, um, mapping the virus using real-time information, and in general, just a community call for making things open um, and accessible. So in um, chemistry world, um, which this article came out last week, a, uh, a researcher named Trevor Bedford, um, who is a computational biologist at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center in Seattle, um, they actually are using genetic sequencing to reconstruct the pathogens spread through Wuhan and other um, areas across China. And they're able to chart variants of the virus and reconstruct a family tree that shows how these mutations relate to each other. And they're doing that through, through open gene data banks and scientists sharing genes with each other or sharing information with each other. I want to pull out two quotes from the article and I have the link there, it's worth reading. Um, the first is from um, Dr. Bedford himself, and it says, um, 
It's worth noting just how different the scientific communication surrounding this outbreak has been, Bedford said. Everything is now completely flipped. Everything is being posted in BioArchive, which is a preprint uh, repository. Modeling groups are posting live analysis via GitHub and other mechanisms. So sort of flipping things on its end and getting information from the quickest available source. And the other is that since January 10th, um, public health institutions, universities inside and outside of China, various disease control centers have publicly shared over 100 different sequences of the virus. Um, so I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, the next is uh, from, a, uh, from Springer Nature. And so um, Springer Nature, which is the publisher of Nature, uh, signed a joint statement with other publishers and scientific and societies to ensure the rapid sharing of research results um, of the virus. And so they had four um, sort of principles. All peer-reviewed research and publications relevant to the outbreak are made immediately open access or freely available, at least for the duration of the outbreak. The second is research findings relevant to the outbreak will be shared immediately with, world, with the World Health Organization upon journal submission with the journal's um, author's knowledge. Research findings are made available via preprint servers before the publication or via other platforms that are appropriate. And then finally, that researchers share interim and uh, final research data related to the outbreak together with protocols and standards used to collect the data. So those are the four things that Springer Nature and other scientific societies are sort of pledging to do during this outbreak in order to help um, contain uh, and eliminate the virus. Um, and even um, the uh, very large academic publisher Elsevier is making all of their articles that are related to the coronavirus publicly available. And I did some research last week. And when you click on this open data portal, it links you to what looks very much like our library's database. And it's a bunch of articles that are specifically about the coronavirus. Um, I don't know how long that stuff will be made publicly available, but as of now it is. Um, and then finally, um, Dr. Lauren Gardner and her team of researchers at uh, the John Hopkins Engineering School, this is probably the more popular example that you've seen, um, created a um, dashboard for tracking cases in real time. Uh, the map's powered by using open data, uh, mostly from the Chinese government um, and uh, other disease control centers throughout the world. And if you're interested in the source of the data, which I was very much interested, um, the John Hopkins Engineering School actually has all their data sources and where they get it from. So. I found that quite fascinating. So that's one. I wanted to provide kind of a real world example of how making your science and your scholarship open can help solve real, real world problems. Um, so what can we do today to help advance scholarship if we're not solving a global health crisis? Um, most of us aren't. Um, we can start by looking at our research workflows and seeing what we can do to eliminate unnecessary barriers to our own research. Um, we can educate ourselves by looking at what others are doing. So we can use the great tool of science, Twitter, and social media to see how others are making their data open, or in their science and scholarship. Um, and it'll help us collaborate with colleagues who are sort of setting a high watermark for the um, data sharing and um, world. Um, and then once we have the education and training that we need to make our own research more open, we can lead by example and we can advocate for others to do the same. So the best way to advocate, like I said, is to lead by example. Um, and leading by example provides future generations of scholars um, the ability to learn and improve upon our methods for disseminating the scholarship in a way that makes science more accessible to everyone. And librarians can help, because we have data librarians. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm going to invite both of our speakers to come up. Um, I realize we're seating you outside the visual area of <laughs> online. Uh, well, if you do. You're welcome to, or maybe just be ready to pop up. Um, do we have any questions in the audience that we'd like to start with? I'm also checking our hashtag FSU Critical Thinking 2020 if you want to post there. Questions? I have a question that we can start with um, for uh, Dr. Rollinger. I was wondering if you have insight from your research on Move On versus the Tea Party, if you could, if you have insight onto like whether which structures were more effective than the other, because they seemed relatively different. Um, maybe they're too different in their aims to really know that. But do you have insight onto, into which structure or which movement was the most effective in sort of growing and reaching their goals? I'll have you come up and use the mic. So yeah, they're really different. But what's so fascinating is they can do really different things as a result. So move on doesn't have to have 
it's people that say, I'm a member of Move On. I'm just so committed to Move On. All they have to do is have some folks that are interested in giving five bucks to support a candidate on the green, New Green Deal, right? So they organize around issues rather than relying on people. So they've been so successful and they've been around since 1998. So that's, you know, that's a long track record, but folk, by focusing on issues rather than people. Tea Party's different. Um, what it successfully did is created communities where people that hadn't known each other before locally were able to connect with each other, become friends, and this mattered for like the 2016 election, even if it didn't matter for the 2012 election, right? But the big downside with the structure of something like the Tea Party movement when you don't have real clear leadership is it was co-opted. So one of the things that folks were always complaining to us about when we were interviewing Tea Party supporters is that they felt as though Republicans had kind of swooped in and hijacked their issues and their goals, made them their own, and they had absolutely no say or control over that. And that included the state of Florida. There were some folks that were really ticked off that there was this caucus and this in the Florida legislature that they couldn't afford to be members of, right? That here are these, it had just become this another sort of elite group that they had been worked out of. So, I mean, there's certainly upsides and downsides, but, you know, and it really depends on what the next kind of generation does, right? So Trump did a great job of mobilizing those communities in 2016. Will he be able to do it in 2020? And what will happen on the other side, right? So what will Democrats do? So if it's not Bernie Sanders that's the candidate, and they have their communities, or the Yang, what were the Yang gangers, right? I got recently asked by Washington Post, what about the Yang gangers? Where are they gonna go? It's like, well, he could stay relevant if he does something with all his popularity, but it's certainly just as likely that someone else could try to find ways to speak to that community and just pick them for themselves. Thanks. Any other questions in the room? Actually, I got one for you again. Here, I'm going to bring a mic so that everybody can hear. Maybe. Aha. Uh -huh. In seeing that Move On moved the party to the left and the Tea Party moved it to the right, um, did you find a growth in the Libertarian Party with people that weren't being included in either side? Oh. So I'm so glad you asked that question because libertarians were furious. Like they were the most furious about this co-optation, right? So they were, libertarians were all in on the Tea Party movement. And they thought this is great. This is about government, the size of government and governmental control. Citizens really do need to be active. We don't need the federal government to be so big. It needs to be more local. And then what happened is, that, particularly in the state of Florida where we studied, it's like the debate shifted to more socially conservative issues and became less about, you know, getting government out of your lives, and they left. They were, we did one study where we kind of tracked what accounted for people staying and leaving the Tea Party movement, and it was political identity. All the libertarians that we had interviewed left. They were just done as soon as it became about something other than size of government. Thank you. Any other questions here in the room? I have a question about the open data. Actually, I was very amazed before I listened to your speech about the open data. Because as a doctor student, one of my biggest challenges is I need to find data, I need to collect data. But before that, um, of course, I want to practice my, um, my, my skills with analyzing the, this data. So I want to know with the library, do you have like a workshop or something you could introduce to us to like how to find open data and depending on different um, topics, sub subjects? I know that there are some workshops. I know that um, Dr. Jesse Klein, who, um, who works in the Department for Social Science, Arts and Humanities, does a workshop on finding um, open government data and open social science data for that purpose. And I believe in STEM we do one specific to chemistry, but I think it's um, like crystal structures and modeling and things like that and looking up those. So um, it would depend on the discipline, but 
the best bet is to connect with one of the research librarians um, individually and have them set up a consultation where they can either walk through the programs or the, um, and I see you waving to Jeff, so you're in great hands if you ask him. Um, and a lot of it is, um, yeah, just sort of like locating those appropriate repositories. I can tell you for education, ICPSR has some things that are really useful. But Jeff is a great source for um, the education data. But in short, yes, um, contact your subject librarian for finding um, open data and utilizing it, but also learning uh, new analysis and techniques and stuff like that. Because we do a lot of workshops on um, in Python and MATLAB and um, also uh, social sciences tools like Qualtrics and um, um, which is a survey tool, and also in vivo is eluding me the name of that program. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to have you stay put because I have a, another question. Uh, but any other questions before I talk about it? Okay. Of course, I'm going to ask this in like a yes or no thing, but you can elaborate if you like. Um, if there's these big publishing companies, Elsevier, Springer, and all of a sudden something like the coronavirus is happening and they make everything open. Are they kind of suggesting that being open helps improve research? Is it just because of speed, or do you think it also helps with quality? Hmm. Well, um, in short, yes, right? Making research data does, um, does sort of help us solve problems quicker. I think the publishers, why they may not be saying that um, it does, by opening up their um, publications and pledging to make everything open and to put things in preprint servers and make data open does suggest that they're, I think they're going to provide evidence that making scholarship open does um, sort of help solve these problems at a much quicker rate. And I think it'll, um, I actually believe it'll set a model for um, hopefully making things more open in general. And instead of just resp responding to global health crises, making things available um, before there's a problem. Not saying that not making information open caused anything, but. I'm going to follow up that question because mine's a little similar but maybe slightly different. I was thinking about how um, open publication increases the impact of publications in general, like impact factors. It does. As you push people toward your research in social and other ways. Um, do you know if there's evidence yet or if there's a, a standardized way yet of measuring the impact of open data versus closed data or if we're trying to figure out what impact it's had above and beyond what it would have originally had? I will say that um, I, I worked, had the privilege to work with a few Europe students um, last semester, where, or last year, I'm sorry, where we explored um, how is research da data being used outside of sort of the ivory tower, if you will. Um, and right now, there isn't a lot of evidence to suggest that that data is being utilized, but we believe, or believed, that team uh, believed that it actually had to do with the lack of knowledge and education of what information was available to others. Um, but I don't know if there's a standard uh, as far as like tracking the impact of open data. I do know that the, the Center for Open Science has recently released um, some sort of measurement for the openness of research journals, but I don't know how much it tracks impact. Um, and I would say I'm not very familiar with it. I've just heard about it, so I can't really elaborate too much. Any other questions for our distinguished speakers? No? No? Let me check Twitter one more time. I have a question. Oh, excellent. It's for Renee. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I'm really interested in exploring sort of like the ethical aspects of digital citizenship. And I mean, this is like kind of an opinion question, but I was hoping maybe we could like talk about it. Do you think researchers have an ethical responsibility to openly share their research and their data? I think they have an ethical responsibility to try and to think about it. Um, like I mentioned earlier, in a lot of cases, there's, um, because of human subject data, there's reasons, very good reasons, why we can't make that data open. But also, um, for specific STEM fields, I know working with uh, certain engineering scholars, um, some of the um, efforts that go into making the results of every single simulation from like an instrument publicly available are prohibitively expensive. And so, you know, there are reasons sometimes to not make everything publicly available. But is there an ethical obligation to try and make things open when possible? I think so. Any other questions? Would you join me in thanking our speakers? Uh,
before you go, a couple things I wanted to remind you of or point out. Um, first of all, on this pillar, we actually have an advertisement for our upcoming data workshops. So you're welcome to take a look if that's something that you might be interested in. Um, we also have a room full of librarians, so feel free to ask all your questions while you're here. Um, also, before you go, please, on the way out, uh, for being such a responsible do digital citizen, we have a sticker for you. It's a great sticker to go on your laptop. Uh, let everybody know that you are primed and ready to be a, a digital citizen. I can't say that word, but the sticker does. Um, <laughs> And also, uh, before you go, please help yourself to refreshments. We have some cookies and coffee. And also, for all the students that are within the sound of my voice, you're welcome to some of those too. If there's any left over. <laughs> all right, thank you all so much for coming. I hope you have a great Monday.